Nature positive is this idea that we can move from a situation of decline into one of restoration and abundance. Welcome to the Future and Sound podcast. I'm your host, Jen Wilson. This is a podcast where we talk about prioritizing people, planet, and profit. In each episode, we'll learn from world-leading experts who can help us see the future we want and a role in it. This is episode 11, Nature Positive. Quick story. About 15 years ago, I was preparing for an interview for my dream job, an internship with the Rocky Mountain Institute, an energy think tank. I scoured the web for information on the organization and its work. One particular story I came across during my research has stuck with me and permanently shifted the way I think about environmental problems. The story was originally shared by Amory Levins, a co-founder of RMI and a former interviewee on the Future and Sound podcast. Technically, my quick story is Amory's quick story, but trust me, it's worth retelling. This is the story of Operation Cat Drop. In the early 1950s, the Dayak people in Borneo had malaria. The World Health Organization had a solution. Spray DDT. They did. Mosquitoes died. Malaria declined. So far, so good. But there were side effects. House roofs started falling down on people's heads because the DDT also killed tiny parasitic wasps that had previously controlled thatch-eating caterpillars. The colonial government gave people sheet metal roofs, but the noise of the tropical rain on the tin roofs kept people awake. Meanwhile, the DDT poison bugs were eaten by geckos, which were eaten by cats. The DDT built up in the food chain and killed the cats. Without the cats, the rats flourished and multiplied. Soon the World Health Organization was threatened with potential outbreaks of typhus and plague and had to call in the RAF of Singapore to conduct Operation Cat Drop, parachuting a great many live cats into Borneo. This story is a guiding parable at Rocky Mountain Institute. Amory's point was that if you don't understand how things are connected, often the cause of problems is quote unquote solutions. Most of today's problems are like that, but we can harness hidden connections. So the cause of solutions is solutions. We solve or better still avoid not just one problem, but many without making new ones before someone has to go parachuting more cats. There are few individuals in the world who have thought more deeply about the relationship between biodiversity and human prosperity than my guest on the show today. Harvey Locke is a Canadian conservationist, writer, and photographer. He's recognized as a global leader in the field of parks, wilderness, wildlife, and large landscape conservation. He's a founder of the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, which aims to create a continuous corridor for wildlife from the Yellowstone National Park in the United States to the Yukon in northern Canada. He is also a global leader in the conservation of nature and halting of biodiversity loss. He's been serving as chair of the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas Beyond the Aichi Targets, which oversees the efficacy of new global conservation targets. Harvey, I'm delighted to have you on the Future and Sound podcast. Welcome. Thank you, Joe. It's a pleasure to be with you. And just to check the pronunciation of Aichi, did I get that right or was I off? I think you did very well. I think it's Aichi, yeah. Aichi, got it, got it. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad that I'm glad that uh, we got that straight. Well, look, I mean, what an incredible background you have, Harvey. I thought that perhaps we could start uh, with a little bit on your journey and how you think. So, I'm interested. What inspired your interdisciplinary career journey? You know, it's kind of a lot starts in your childhood, and in my case, um, 
Uh, I grew up, I, I was born and grew up in and near the city of Calgary in Western Canada, which is on the edge of the Rocky Mountains. And there's a, there's a national park in the Rocky Mountains called Banff National Park, where both my parents are from. And so we just kind of treated that landscape as, as one area in our family. I live in Banff National Park now. And that was sort of the normal world to me. And that world's kind of an interesting world. On one side, are the Great Plains that are heavily transformed and have lost a lot of their, their nature. Not all of it, though. And in front of you is one of the wildest places in the world that people visit. So you have this really interesting sort of Janus-faced or two-faced thing going on subconsciously. I loved skiing. Um, I liked hiking. And when I finished high school, um, I spent my first year of college in Switzerland in the Alps. And I was really surprised that the outcome of that wasn't, I had a lot of fun skiing, which I did, or learn French, which was the goal, but also that I realized that the Alps had been severely degraded environmentally. And that actually turned me into an environmentalist. The, the, the place I lived was beautiful, but there was, I remember the only living thing I saw there, other than, you know, planted trees and things, were snails that came out after the rain in late May, and a buddy of mine rounded them up and tried to sell them to a restaurant. And the restaurateur freaked out and said, those are an endangered species, put them back, get them away from me. And that was like, compared to a place where you might see a wolf or a grizzly bear or, or a sea elk and, and things like that. It's just like, wow. And aesthetically similar, but ecologically in tremendously different condition. And that is actually why I'm talking to you today was this unexpected turn in my life. And when I came back to Canada, of course, I went to university, I did my undergraduate degree in French, and then I, I went to law school and uh, became a lawyer. And in those summers of university, I worked in Banff National Park. And then my, my legal career was uh, a corporate commercial legal career initially in a big law firm in downtown Calgary. And then about 1989, environmental law was born. And I was already the volunteer president of the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society at that point. And my practice sort of morphed into doing a lot of environmental law things, and in particular, working on nature-oriented things with some of the top experts in the world as expert witnesses. And if you're a barrister or a trial lawyer, as they're called in different countries, you actually have to learn a lot about your subject matter to be effective. So I had all these tremendous teachers. What I learned how to do, though, was to make their tremendous knowledge coherent and intersect with each other's knowledge. Because for example, doing regulatory hearings, I'd have four expert witnesses. And if each of them said something in a stove pipe that was profoundly important and it didn't amount to a picture that the decision maker could follow, it wouldn't have had any impact. So I learned how to work with experts and form pictures that they all agreed were accurate and look for the synergies between their ideas. And then I, I, I got involved in, in a North American organization that I became president of called the Wildlands Project, whose goal was corridors across the continent of North America. And again, I worked with some of the top scientists um, in the field of conservation biology, in fact, founders of the field of conservation biology there. And I started to realize I'm actually understanding this. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I can see opportunities for synthesis because of that strange background that I have, like, my only science training is in geology, and that's just a few courses in undergrad in university. However, as I got deeper and deeper into it, I saw patterns and saw, well, gee, the, the legal things I'm doing are showing repeated patterns of these same issues. And that kind of led to me thinking about this idea of a corridor from Yellowstone to Yukon. But again, you know, all ideas emerged from their time. It wasn't like I was Moses on the mountain and suddenly the stuff was revealed to me. But nonetheless, the synthesis and the coherence and the, the sort of way of thinking about the narrative arc of these things is something that, that I bring to it. And as things have unfolded, you get deeper and deeper into it. I became very interested in global conservation. I got very, very involved globally, particularly interested in parks and wilderness, as you mentioned in your bio, the health of wildlife, particularly what I call the most vulnerable in the world, which are actually large ranging mammals. They're the most vulnerable thing in the world, even though they look fierce and powerful and dangerous. They're actually the things that we humans cooperate with least. So I became more and more interested in that. And then I, I started to realize that these are all part of an intricate part of a system. That system is deeply related to the, the entire functioning of the planet. 
um, how the climate works, which is really a function of, of you know, where carbon is in the system, whether it's in the ground or in the sky or in the ocean or in the living layer of the earth, carbon goes somewhere and that's the climate change problem. And of course, all life is carbon, right? So mm-hmm. you, you start realizing these things come together and come together. And so that started, you know, I started getting more deeply engaged in climate policy, thinking about, you know, how this all amounts to a healthy world. So as that evolved, I started publishing more and more things in scientific journals and working with more and more colleagues. And um, at one point I was working on a book on the world's great national parks with National Geographic. And I traveled around the world taking pictures and writing notes and meeting people. And then that project didn't move ahead for various change reasons at National Geographic. But my network had become quite global. And then when the uh, World Conservation Congress occurred in Hawaii, and this idea of where are we going from here next, um, that's when I was appointed to be chair of that global task force by my peers in the World Commission on Protected Areas. And that then took me on this wonderful global journey where I was fortunate to have enough resources to meet with people all over the world in Africa or China or Europe or South America or North America, wherever, Australia. And listen, just listen to people and look for syntheses. And I came up with an idea that the world's basically in three conditions and that it can help us navigate the future. So, And then the final thing that happened is I got very involved with all the leaders of the global environmental movement and the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, Business for Nature, and people like that, World Economic Forum. And we started thinking about how can we do something that makes the nature challenge work the way the climate challenge works with a goal like carbon neutrality or net zero, and also human development with the sustainable development goals, which is focused on equity among humans. And we came up with this idea of creating a nature positive world. So that's kind of the strange journey that I've been on. And every day looks like what I just said. (laughs) Harvey, that's a fascinating uh, career journey. And one of the things before I get into this nature positive idea, I'd love to hear, I mean, you've been in this conservation space for decades. How would you describe what's changed in the past decade or so and the important point that we're at right now? What are the macro trends and where should my business audience be looking for the important pieces of conservation in the next, say, five to 10 years? Well, I like looking at history to help inform the present. So it might surprise people, but about 120 years ago, we had a major extinction crisis of large mammals. And that led to the creation or upgrading of the management of national parks all over the English speaking world and the creation of many other national parks in non English speaking countries and creation of wildlife sanctuaries. And that was very much about, you know, saving something somewhere. And then through the next hundred years, the science of ecology emerged and it taught us that you actually need to think about what these things do, not just that they exist, but what are they doing in relation to each other, in relation to the landscape, in relation to the health of the earth. And that led to a, a, an increasing awareness of, of we can't let any of these things die off. And so you get things like the Endangered Species Act in the United States in the early 70s. At a global level, there was the first Stockholm conference about called Man and His Environment, which was the first global thing in early 70s, a big wave of interest. That's when things like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act were passed in many places, um, including where I live. And then we go through another cycle and people kind of drift away from the concern. And then in 1991, you have the Rio conventions, deep concern, climate's changing, the ozone layer has had a hole in it, species are going extinct. The deserts are expanding. We've got to get our act together as a humanity. And those create the real conventions that we all talk about now. So when somebody says they were at COP26 in Glasgow, they were at a real convention event or the Convention on Biodiversity. I've been working towards the same thing. And each of those through time has been about a deepening crisis and the chance to avert it. Today, we're actually so deep into a crisis, we don't have a chance to avert it. So the problem we have now is basically if you use a metaphor of a horse in a barn, the horse is not in the barn, the horse is galloping, it's run across the field and it's outside the gate, and the question is whether we can catch it before it goes over a cliff. And that's a really different moment in time than any other that anyone has ever experienced, and in my view it calls for a lot of creativity and why I'm so happy 
can be talking to you in the business audience, is the other thing we've learned is the environmental community can't be viewed as a sector that will solve this aspect of multiple concerns. The environment is the context for everything everyone does. It's not the property of the environmental movement. It needs to be everyone's problem and everyone who's smart needs to be contributing a solution. So I view conversations like this as super important. And that's a big part of this nature positive idea is to let go a little bit and open up the possibilities of who else can contribute to solving this problem. And of course, I mean, if we look, you mentioned that you did a few classes uh, in geology and we have gone over a cliff. The horse has gone over a cliff in the past in terms of mass extinctions, not just the dinosaurs. There've been, there've been many extinctions in the past. And so it's, it's not inconceivable to think that that could happen if we don't take action. Well, you know, there's the comprehensive assessment done by a group called the IPBS, which is the body that advises the biodiversity convention, said there's a million species at risk of extinction. That we don't know how to manage the planet without all the, the parts that move. And it would be sort of like if there was a really nice Rolex and it wasn't working and you gave it to me and said, hey, Harvey, would you fix this? I don't have a clue how to do that. I'm a smart guy, but I don't know how to fix Rolex. And imagine something 10 zillion times more complex than a Rolex, not created by a human in the first place. And you're just tearing parts out of it all the time, which is what we're doing. And shifting the conditions in which it operates, which is what's happening with the climate putting lots of toxins in the, the, the blood veins of a system like too many herbicides, pollutants, and, and fertilizers, which leads to these dead zones in the ocean. With the shifting chemistry of the world, we're actually creating less oxygen in the world's oceans, which is actually also what we breathe eventually. You know, you look at the scale of the things that are going on, and they are at that level of what you described as a horse going over the cliff before, where you actually start messing with the basic function of the planetary system. You put your own niche of life as a human at risk, as well as the lives of all these other wonderful things that we co-evolved with. And that's our moment. And it's a frightening moment. But it's also a moment where, you know, reasonable people should be called to action and really want to lean in and do something. And so I really view this as, an opportunity for people in business, people who have capital, to say, this is my problem. I want to solve it. Not, I'll write a check to these guys and feel good, or those people will solve the problem, I'll carry on. This is all hands on deck, and all the creativity in the world is needed to solve the problem. What we can provide as experts is some guidance on what might be effective. But clearly, if we were good at what we do, And I've been very active for a very long time. If we knew how to solve the problem as an environmental community, you and I would not be talking today. Mm -hmm. We haven't succeeded. And to to the idea that the environmental community or Department of Environment somewhere is going to solve these problems, it's just a false idea. So we need more people helping to solve this problem. And with this all hands on deck idea, I want to come back to the principle of uh, nature positive. Harvey, could you give us an overview of the the core tenets or principles of nature positive? I mean, what does it mean? Well, nature positive is this idea that we can move from a situation of decline into one of restoration and abundance. Uh, It has to be done consciously. It can't be done by sort of managing at the edges to reduce impacts. We need to set a global goal for nature. And that goal needs to be to halt and reverse the loss of biodiversity or the living layer of the world and its interactions with the non-living elements of the world. We need that to happen fast. So that such that by 2030, we've sort of turned the curve. You know, you hear about people bending the curve for COVID. We need to bend the curve of biodiversity loss such that instead of being on a negative trajectory downward, that curve is moved, has moved upward by 2030, which is the milestone year for UN agreements and then is moving towards the full flourishing of life again. Because we're not dealing with preventing a problem, we're in the middle of a problem. So what we have to do is stop digging the hole. In other words, preserve all the fragments of the world that are left in a natural state. And there's some very big pieces of the world in a natural state, but whether it's small, a little woodland in England, or big like the Amazon rainforest, or Antarctica, we have to keep everything intact intact. And we also have to do restoration 
because we've done so much harm in so many places. And those two things together will allow us to halt and reverse biodiversity loss and work towards a nature positive world. And the idea is really simple. It's like, you know, if you're, if you're a business, you don't want your costs to exceed your revenues. Well, right now our costs are greatly exceeding our revenues, if you will, on how the world functions. And this is unhealthy. And so we've got to have a common goal for that. And countries can do it. Individuals can do it. If they're private landowners, for example, tribal people can do it and business can do it. And I think the business opportunity is especially important because at the end of the day, it doesn't do much to have a large accumulation of capital in an unlivable planet. I think it's a fascinating way of framing this nature positive uh, concept. I have a few follow-up questions. I I'd love to get some examples. So let's imagine, imagine Harvey, you're an emerging executive, you know, in corporate Canada, and you hear about this nature positive concept. It really resonates with you. What are some of the steps that you can take to show that you're all hands on deck? Well, one of the interesting things um, that I learned from my global studies, travels and meeting with experts, is basically the world's uh, in basically three conditions. There's large wild areas, which is about 26% of the world. So in northern Canada, that's the boreal forest. In the Arctic in South America, that's the Amazon basin. In Africa, the Congo basin, and so on. <laughs> then at the other end of the scale, there's the world that's heavily transformed by humans which we call cities and farms. And that's about 18% of the world. And that's where humans truly are the dominant thing in the landscape. And then in between, there's this area we call the shared landscape, which is a mix of, of intact areas, a mix of industrial practices like logging, mining, oil and gas, a little bit of grazing maybe, but it's not really suitable to cultivation-based agriculture, but it's still got people doing lots of stuff in it. And, and then, of course, those large wild areas also have people living in them who've been there for a very long time, just practicing more traditional ways of life than the modern industrial way of life. So one of the things you can do if you're sitting in, say, Toronto, and you've got operations, is assess where you operate against those three conditions. Now, if you're running a business of restaurants in Toronto, and that's all you do, and you say you've got a chain of 20 restaurants, well, you can look at your, where does my food come from? And what's the supply chain? And what's that doing to the city and farm landscape? Is it being produced in a way that is allowing for some room for nature, for pollinators to live? Are the people producing my food keeping their chemicals out of rivers or out of the Great Lakes in that case? Or you could be sitting as an executive in Vancouver of a mining company and you can look at the landscape and say, well, I've got a global footprint. Where am I operating? What am I doing? What are the values in that landscape? What can I do, even if I'm operating my mind, to actually look at that and make it better and think about the context? So my mind isn't just about controlling the impacts of my mind. It's thinking about my mind as a, as a thing in a landscape, and minds are really big impacts. So you better have a pretty big impact at a landscape scale to, to, to try to mitigate that. Or if you were you know, sitting in uh, London and you had a global operation of say you were sourcing for a grocery store chain and you were looking at, you know, where does your palm oil come from? And people are doing these things, some of these things already. So it's not like I'm inventing any new thinking. But what I think we can do is marshal it and simplify it. Just say, so where do you operate? What are your impacts? And then there are a series of strategies you can engage in depending on what's going on. You know, everyone in the world can immediately figure out where the large intact wild areas of the world are and say, I'm not going to go disturb those. Mm -hmm. Everybody could just decide that today because we actually can't afford to knock down any more systems. And if you're interested, I'll explain why at the level of our health, leaving these big intact systems intact is necessary. I would love to dig into, into that piece, Harvey, but before we do, if we just stick with, so say, for example, I, I am really appreciating the examples linked to agriculture, linked to mining, et cetera, there's also finance. So we heard at COP26 an interest in the financial community to ensure that investments are made with a, a broader sense of, of the environmental, social, and governance impacts. And I'm just wondering if you were in finance and you're looking to invest either in private or public companies, 
how can you apply a bit of that nature positive lens? Well, I think as an investor, assuming that means you're controlling capital as mm-hmm. opposed to borrowing money, you're in a really good position to say, well, the return that I want on my money has to have value. Mm-hmm. And just like inflation can degrade the value of cash, the degradation of the earth right now will degrade the value of everyone's holdings. So you can say, okay, uh, the climate, nature, human development issues, all of those things put my capital at risk. I need to contribute to securing an environment in which those things will do better than they are now so that my capital is not at risk and that I have earnings to spend in a world that's still appealing and that my children can enjoy. And so if you look at it that way, then you can look at your investments that way. And there's lots of opportunity to invest in change, transition, There's lots of opportunity to encourage those things you're already invested in to think about these questions. But it's a little bit more than the triple bottom line. It's actually, the facts are that every business in the world has an operating context. Mm -hmm. That operating context, people are very aware of. They're always analyzing, what's the regulatory environment? Is there a corruption problem? And all these questions are normal for a CEO to think through of a business or for an investor to think about before putting up capital, a board of directors to think about. Well, the real operating context for everyone is the health of the planet. There is no other operating context that matters as much. And the next level of the operating context is the health of society. And then inside that is the business operating context. And the economy is only there to serve people. And people are only there at the pleasure of the planetary health system. And if you don't believe me on that, just do through the hierarchy. It's really simple. You can have a planet with lots of things going on without people. You can have people without a planet that's functioning in a life zone that supports us. You can have people without an economy, but you cannot have an economy without people. Economy is a whole creation there of people. Mm-hmm. So getting that conceptual hierarchy right is actually the most important thing that we could ask capital to do. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as you get that right, you're going to start thinking through your problems differently. Because, you know, you're, you're always thinking about those questions when you're deploying your capital in terms of operating environment, regulatory regimes, corruption, skilled workforce, stability, democracy, um, you know, th- those things are normal risk assessment things for someone deploying a lot of capital in the world. Well, just think about, well, that's actually a subset of your problem. And, you know, expand it up a bit. You know, why do we need to care about the equitable side of human development if we were deploying capital? Well, think of the fact that we have a refugee crisis now that's many times worse than it was at the end of World War II when we created our refugee rules. And it's going to get worse and worse because the world is degrading around those people who are more abundant than they've ever been population-wise. And as we've seen in Europe, Mediterranean is no obstacle to people flooding across. And North America isn't going to be exempt either, even though we have large oceans. You can see some of the some of the demographic pressures going on from Central America, pushing through the United States to the border. Th- these problems are problems of us not having thought through that conceptual hierarchy properly. Mm-hmm. And when we do, I'm really excited that if people think that through, they're really capable of being innovative and protecting their capital and growing their capital in creative ways. And it's kind of like, a, I was just reading a biography of Adam Smith when we were in Edinburgh and just got my head into seeing his statue and so on. And that's what he was thinking through, like the world changed. The world had changed from a landowner-based thing to a more trade-oriented economy. And there, there was a profound social shift going on then when he wrote The Wealth of Nations. We're in that same place now. The profound shift is the context of our lives is shifting under our feet. And we need the same kind of innovation, thought, and fearlessness that those, the people in the Scottish Enlightenment applied, which is basically the foundation of the Western market economy. We need that level of engagement and thought now. And we need people engaged in that to think about it now. And it was so fascinating reading about that is, you know, there there were clubs in the cities like Edinburgh and Glasgow where people would sit and think about this. And they they weren't just talking about return on capital. They were talking about their role in society and how to make the society, you know, a good, honorable place. And there's these social goals then, not environmental goals, because they didn't know that they needed them. 
we're very much an inherent part of that conversation. We've got to get back to that. And, and I would argue that if you have a lot of capital, nobody should care about this more than you because all that's at risk. Absolutely. This idea of the Adam Smith level shift in thinking is, is really intriguing. And it strikes me that one of the challenges we have is the classic metrics for success. And I'm about to ask you a very challenging question. And so maybe take a piece of it. Um, but one of the things that my clients are asking about is, okay, we get nature is really important. We get that conservation is really important. It's so complicated. We're used to these generally accepted accounting principles and we know how that works. And even that can be really complicated to follow the rules. How do we start to think about measuring say, nature positive, figuring out what does good look like and how can we track to see if we're actually improving? What do you think, Harvey? Well, let's talk about generally accepted accounting principles. They're there for a purpose, right? They're there for transparency. Um, and they're there to allow people to look at information and evaluate. And they're, they're a snapshot of the, the, the sort of financial health of the business, both in terms of its revenues but also its capital and its debt picture, right? That's, that's what those things are for. Well, right now, you know that that's an incomplete document because what you're not taking into account is actually your macro environment. So you've got to expand your thinking beyond that because your balance sheet has not been balanced. It's not giving you a true reflection of the conditions in which you're operating. The next question is, well, what could you do? You know, accounting systems didn't just evolve overnight. Oh, here's gap. We're done. You know, and, and even if you look in the last 15 years, there's been some really substantial changes made to how people do accounting, taking into account capital market shifts and stuff like that. So it's, it's not like those things were born through some immaculate conception and everybody has to obey them. Hundreds of years of evolution. Yeah, they evolve. And so yeah. they better evolve fast now. And so you asked me the question, what would your metrics be? Well, if you... If you thought about it, like, for example, at the level of those three conditions of the world I mentioned, where do you operate? Inside each of those, look at your operations. How could you make things better while running your business for those conditions, both for, for people, for the health of the, 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 the nature, and not contribute to changing the climate? Right? And people are already wrestling with this net zero um, carbon neutrality as a as a corporate strategy. Well, imagine wrestling with the package because the package is what's gonna matter. And in case people didn't catch it in Glasgow, it was said out loud in the Glasgow Climate Pact that protecting nature is key to meeting global temperature climate goals. Mm -hmm. That's an unquestionable truth because it's actually all about where carbon is and carbon's in nature. Some of the time you wanna keep it there, you don't wanna mobilize it into the sky. And you also want it to be able to absorb stuff out of the sky. And all of our climate models are based on the idea that nature stays at the level of intactness it had when those models were developed. And of course, nature's degraded heavily since those models were developed, which is why we need to get nature positive in a hurry. Because if we want to stabilize our climate, we've got to get back to the condition that those models were developed in that we're all managing for now. Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing how serious this is and how simple it is to understand if you get the abstractions right. And so then the question is, okay, how do I operate? This is not an externality. This is a contextual fact of your life. Unfortunately, you were trained to ignore it. Your principles ignore it. Because you didn't need to know it before. Because we thought the world was infinite. Guess what? That assumption was wrong. Therefore, there are no externalities. Therefore, you've got to internalize the impact of all that you do and all that you're generating, or else you put everything you're generating at risk. Absolutely fascinating. And one of the points that you brought up earlier before we got into key performance indicators or metrics, you were saying there's this really important connection between health and protecting biodiversity. And, I'm, and perhaps we could talk a little bit about uh, the Yellowstone to Yukon conservation initiative. Um, a little bit on that project and also how does that conservation initiative link to health, Harvey? Well, you know, the state of the landscape is the state of the landscape for everything that lives there, all the species, including humans. And in the case of the Yellowstone-Yukon region, if you go back to the first article I wrote, which was a discussion piece that 30 years ago, 
you know, I, I called it Mother of Rivers and Wild Heart of North America. So this is the last place sort of in settled North America where you have things like grizzly bears and wolves and the full functioning system. It's also the headwaters for all the rivers that water the west of North America. And literally the Colorado, the Columbia, Mackenzie, the Saskatchewan, the Missouri, they all rise in the Fraser, they all rise in that system. So there's an interest in the health of that system that transcends just its wonderful natural values. And why it uh, was especially resonant, I think, in part, was when I chose the words Yellowstone to Yukon, I was plugging into cultural resonances about national park, about the wild places. When you hear Yellowstone to Yukon, you don't think I'm selling you shoes. You don't think it's a hamburger. You kind of know what I'm talking about the minute out of my mouth. It's what it says on the tin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was very deliberately done. I chose those words. And, and I understood they actually had cultural resonance before I ever phrased it. I also understood that, that that's actually at some scale how the landscape worked. And it turned out that scientists have validated over and over and over again that that's the right scale as a subset of the planet to think at. And it's also kind of how we see ourselves. Those of us who live here understand there's something bigger going on. You know, a direct example of a, of a really small scale human health issue is we have highways across the mountains. We have animals across those highways. We have collisions. The animals die and people get hurt. We can, we can avoid that by building crossing structures on highways over and under the road, along with thoughtful fencing. And we've pioneered that in the Yellowstone Yukon region. We have more of those systems than anywhere else in the world on different roads. And hopefully we'll continue to do it until the entire landscape is mitigated for that. It's good for nature, it's good for people, it's good for our consciousness. It's kind of a nice way to live. And we also need beauty and nature in our lives to be fully healthy humans. And we need to know that places exist that aren't going downhill. And, you know, there's a huge amount of despair right now among young people. And by young people, I mean, you know, people are university age now, high school. Um, they have a huge dose of pessimism and they're right to have it. That's the horror. And one of the things that I heard, I didn't write it, but I quote it, the job of every generation is to give hope to the next. Mm -hmm. Our generation, and by, by our generation, I mean baby boomers, um, Gen Xs, and even now Gen Yers, are bequeathing despair to the next. That's not acceptable. That's like a failure of our intergenerational duty. If we, if we shift at another scale of the human health question, there's all this nonsense about a lab in Wuhan being the, the, the source of the pandemic. We know that pandemics like SARS, uh, COVID-19 virus, have mostly got their origins in disturbed natural ecosystems. There's a cascade called the infect, shed, spill, and spread cascade. And I'll explain that really simply, because once you understand it, you'll never forget it. Bats, in particular, in tropical forests, often have viruses. They get infected with a virus. Well, it doesn't matter if you're infected with a virus if it's not symptomatic or doing anything. When you stress those bats, those viruses become manifest and they're in a position to shed. So what do I mean by that? Think of you were in university and people had cold sores that you never saw until exam time. And all of a sudden, these herpes plaques of virus would appear on people's faces and they were contagious when they appear. That's the stress thing creating the conditions where the virus manifests. That sheds into either another animal or indirectly onto a person. And then that spills into the human population and then if it's heavily connected spreads. That's where pandemics come from, is that cycle more than any other cycle. And it all starts in the destruction of nature. If you go to Lyme disease, which is, you know, not about tropical forests and stuff, but is a very common problem in Eastern North America, that's also even making it hard for people to enjoy going to their beautiful cottages and get caught because they're afraid they're going to get Lyme disease. Lyme disease is from having collapsed the biodiversity in those systems so far down that white-footed mice, which are a super vector for Lyme disease, are hyperabundant because they're not being kept under control by predators. Uh, normally, if there's a lot of biodiversity, lots of different species, there's white-footed mice with the virus always, but they're not so abundant that they move the stuff around so intensely. But now they are. 
And so you're, you're seeing it at the level of that cities and farms kind of landscape right through to the wildest places. There's a term for this that the World Health Organization developed called One Health, which is the health of the planet is the health of people. And we need to understand that, that, that we are biological organisms interacting with other biological organisms and the non-biological part of the world every day. And that we are not above those laws. We are subject to those laws. When you're diagnosing, okay, authentic leadership on conservation within the business community, are there any examples that spring to mind or are there any particular things like the opposite of greenwashing that you look for? Rather than singling someone out, let me offer the sort of ideas. So, you know, I went to a nature dinner at the World Economic Forum a couple of years ago. The room was full of people, business leaders, who are interested in the problem. And one of them said to me at dinner, you know, I really want to do something here, but until my operating environment shifts, my margins in my business are all high volume, low margin. I can't act alone. I just can't. I want to, but I can't. Um, and this is why we need to get critical masses of people saying, this is our problem. And not to create a cartel or any of those sort of, you know, monopolistic trade practices, but to say a critical mass of us have to go here. We have to establish that that's a minimum valid operating market condition approach. And this kind of, you know, at the highest level, this kind of goes back to things like slavery, which were seen as a foundation of the economy, and then were seen as morally unacceptable. And our economy has actually done very, very well, thank you, without slavery. But there were times that people, perhaps in good faith, said, well, yes, it's morally uh, repulsive, but uh, we're stuck. And, you know, there's a lot of reevaluation of the founding fathers of the United States and the slaveholders and their language about against that. And why didn't they make change earlier? Well, it's complicated to make change. And so, you know, they can still be in good faith. But it's just think, well, I'm, I am the way I am. I'm stuck where I'm stuck because things are the way they are. The problem with that is we know where that has taken us to now. Not where it's leading, but where we are. So another metaphor from the climate conference is stand in the water up to your mid-calf. That's where you are right now, and the water's rising. So um, that gets everyone. That's not about you or me. It's about all of us. And th this is the thing that I would say. So if you're a business leader and you're concerned about this stuff, find ways to act. Align your employees. And I'm certain from what I've read, at least in North American and European stuff, most employees under 35 years old that you want to attract in these tight labor markets hold these values and fears already. And they're deeply concerned about it. I've even had people in relatively senior management positions talk to me and cry about how frustrated they are that their businesses won't move, even though they have great jobs and great career paths, but they're scared. And leadership involves leading people somewhere where they can imagine they can go on their own. If you're a true leader, then you need to lead through the problem that confronts you now. This is the problem that confronts all of us now. It's hard work. It's also exciting work. And with that, I'd, I'd love to ask my final question uh, to you, Harvey. So you are an avid photographer. And I wanted to ask if there's a particular photo, I, it's going to be very difficult to pick one out, um, but if there's a, a particular photo that is most prized or just really that you're most connected to, uh, and if so, what that photo is of and what the story is behind it. Well, actually, that's a really neat question. There's two. One of them is behind me. <laughs> um, and that one is of a scene on the edge of Banff National Park in Mount Assiniboine Provincial Park uh, in the Canadian Rockies, Yellowstone, Yukon region where I live. And it's actually, it kind of looks like a romantic painting, but it's actually a photograph that I took one evening that just everything converged perfectly. And this is what photographers dream of. And it, it, it describes to me the beauty of the world and the, the, the spiritual dimension of when we align ourselves well with the, with the forces of nature, with the divine spirit, the world is a better and more beautiful place. And it means that to me. The other one is a picture I took of a tiger in India in 2005, where I was uh, going through a period of transition in my life. I was alone in a very remote place in India, a tiger reserve. And I was seeing tigers, which is incredibly, they're the coolest animal you can imagine. They're just 
They're so powerful and they're so self-confident and they're so vulnerable. So you have all these things embedded in the tiger. And seeing these, there's two pair of them and one of them got up and moved. And I said to my driver, you know, I think it's going to go over there. Can we go over there? When you're these little open air Jeeps, I'm in the back, got my big camera. And the tiger went exactly to where I anticipated it would go. And it stopped and it looked at me. And I looked at it and I got a wonderful photograph of it. And it was this moment of engagement where I realized, you know, this is every bit as cool as the grizzly bears or the bison or whatever I care about at home. That this is the whole planet matters, everything alive on the planet matters. And that actually unlocked my interest or created my deep commitment to working at the global scale. So those pictures matter to me. It's a beautiful story, you know, beauty at home and abroad, tying it all together for a better world. Harvey Locke, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. What, what a nice conversation to have. And I'm so pleased that there's this interest at, uh, in your business audience and just thinking through these deep problems as co-collaborators rather than problem management. Absolutely. Thank you to Harvey for joining us. You can learn more about his work by checking out the links in the episode description or by visiting re.co.com slash the future and sound. The future and sound podcast is written and hosted by Jen Wilson and produced by Chris Attaway. This podcast is brought to you by Rico, a software as a service company, helping clients achieve resilient competitive advantage in the long term. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to tell a friend about it. And if you have a moment, rate us in your podcast app. Until next time, thanks for listening.